Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on North Iceland with Discover the World. My name is William Gray. I'm a travel writer and photographer, and I've worked with Discover the World for many years and been lucky enough to visit Iceland with them on several occasions. There's never been a better time to visit Iceland with new direct flights to Akureyri, gateway to the north, starting just this last weekend. So we'll be showing you why North Iceland is such an amazing destination, but also how you can easily combine it with other parts of Iceland. So stay tuned for a virtual journey to natural wonders like Lake Miva and the huge waterfall of Detifoss. You'll discover Europe's top whale watching destination, obtain expert advice on touring the Diamond Circle and Arctic Coast Way, and learn from Discover the World, the world's leading experts on Iceland, how to make the most of your trip to this incredible country. I'm delighted to say that we also have our panel of travel experts to answer the questions. Anheider Johansdottir has been working for Visit North Iceland since 2011 and spending her days showcasing the fantastic attractions and natural wonders of North Iceland and the Arctic North as a year-round destination. She works with something like 250 tourism companies and she knows the region inside out and we're really looking forward to tapping into her extensive knowledge. One of Discover the World's Iceland travel specialist, Eric has been to Iceland 10 times. One of his favorite things about North Iceland is how much there is to see without having to travel far. He says you could easily have one base and within one hour be whale watching, visiting an amazing waterfall or relaxing in a geothermal pool. Please do send in your questions to our panel using the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, thank you if you've already sent in a question. We've had a great response, but don't worry, if we don't have time to answer your questions here, um, please do um, call our travel specialists and they'll be only too happy to talk through your questions. You can also find out more information online at discovertheworld.com or by talking to one of our travel specialists, as I say. Don't forget, you can now also arrange uh, a virtual appointment by video call to discuss your holiday plans. To give you an idea of the format for this evening, um, I'll be spending the next 35 minutes or so delving into the wonders of North Iceland and taking on a quick tour of the country's other regions. And we'll then go to our panel for 30 minutes of questions and answers before wrapping things up at about 7.15. To start with, let me give you some background to discover the world. They've been organizing holidays to Iceland for over 38 years. They were the world's first tour operator uh, to offer self-drive itineraries there, um, as well as river rafting, snowmobiling, and super jeep safaris. They practically invented whale watching, actually in North Iceland, way back in 1993. They also launched school trips and were the first UK tour operator to offer dedicated Northern Lights holidays to this country. I think it's rare, actually, to find an independent tour operator with that kind of heritage, and whenever I'm dealing with the team at um, Discover the World, I always feel like I'm, I'm talking to genuine experts who really know the place inside out. And I think that kind of passion and first-hand advice really counts for a lot nowadays when there's so much online that you're not sure what to trust or not. A couple of things worth highlighting. The various holiday itineraries um, I'll mention later are just suggestions or, or starting points. Discover the world love nothing more than to tailor make your holiday until it's just right for you. That might mean extending your holiday, upgrading accommodation, pre-booking some great excursions, or arranging something really special on a private basis. There's little availability left for July and August this year, but September and October are stunning months to visit North Iceland. And winter is also spectacular. We'll look at the seasons later on in more detail, and I know both our panellists have lots to tell us about that. But the general message is, if you're keen to travel next summer, try to book as early as possible. Let's start with the big news then. Next, oh, actually, just started actually this last weekend, new direct flights with nice air from the UK to Akureyri. 
taking you straight to the heart of Iceland's spectacular north. You can touch down, grab the keys to your hire car, and within a few hours of leaving Stansted or Manchester, you could be roaming one of Europe's best driving routes, the Diamond Circle or the Arctic Coast Way. To give you a flavor of what, of what lies in store, we've made this little 60 second video. So why do we love North Iceland? I think this photo kind of speaks for itself. It shows Kolufossa, just one of the many draw dropping waterfalls you'll come across on your travels, but it captures just how rugged and untouched this part of Iceland is. It's brimming with natural wonders. This is Lake Miva, a huge spring fed freshwater lake nuzzled in a dramatic volcanic landscape. There's a road right around it, perfect for a lakeside circuit taking in all the geological features that surround this wonderful feature, like uh, craters, lava fields, geothermal springs, bubbling mud pits. Again, we'll look at this in a lot more detail in a second. Even the light up here is a natural wonder. North Iceland is just a whisker below the Arctic Circle, perfect for witnessing the midnight sun in all its glory. In fact, from May to August, there's 24 hour daylight and you can enjoy long, long days well into September. But Iceland's definitely not a once in a lifetime place to visit. You have to visit at least twice. Once in summer for the midnight sun, and of course, autumn, winter or early spring for the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. It's a year round destination. Here you can see the Aurora in full glow um, over Godafoss, another of the stunning waterfalls of the North. But don't run away with the idea that North Iceland is some kind of untamed, untrammeled wilderness requiring an expedition to experience. It certainly has the wilderness, but it also has towns and villages, many of them fishing communities rich in character and tradition. By following sections of the Diamond Circle and Arctic Coast Way, you can join the dots between them staying in fabulous waterside hotels or authentic Icelandic farms and summer houses a slow, gentle paced holiday, taking you off the beaten track. There are plenty of opportunities to relax too. Gently poaching yourself in an outdoor geothermal pool is a national pastime in Iceland. And there are several amazing places to take a dip in North Iceland. This is GOC on the edge of the Arctic Ocean, but I'll show you some other equally enticing spots later. We don't want to lounge around all the time though, there's just so much to see and do. And I think whale watching is going to be right at the top of your wish list. The small port of Husavik in Europe's, uh, is Europe's whale watching capital. In fact, North Iceland is a top wildlife destination all around, I think. Puffins and other seabirds breed on the wild peninsulas and offshore islands. And Lake Niva is a magnet to waders and wildfowl. You'll also spot seals all over the place as you tour the Arctic coast way. Or how about a four wheel drive super Jeep safari into the interior? North Iceland provides one of the best access points for exploring the vast wilderness of volcanic desert, glacial rivers, lava flows and ice caps. But the simple, overwhelming, irresistible pool of North Iceland lies in its raw beauty. I can't think of many other places, certainly in Europe, just a, a three hour flight away that offers such mesmerizing scenery and standout features the vast majority of which are free to visit. So what you need to know if you want to witness sunsets, say, over this mysterious Vitserka sea stack? 
or sit here feeling the ground tremble next to Detifos, one of Europe's most powerful waterfalls? Well, I reckon a map is always a good place to start. So here obviously is Iceland, and the region we're looking at is up here in the north, North Iceland, characterized by several huge wild peninsulas, deep fjords and bays. Let's pinpoint Akureyri, there it is, gateway, capital to the north, and the destination for those new direct flights from London, Stansted and Manchester. Until now, you'd have to fly to Keflavik down there in the southwest, um, and then take an internal flight north. But don't worry if Stansted or Manchester aren't convenient departure points for you. Discover the World also offer flights to Iceland from Gatwick, Heathrow, Luton, Bristol, Belfast, Glasgow and Edinburgh, and can arrange the internal flights necessary to get you up to the north. Here's Akureyri, capital of the north, Iceland's second largest city. Don't expect a, a sprawling metropolis, though. Akureyri only has a population of around 19,000 people. I guess that's similar in size to, to Cobham, Wantage or Selby here in the UK, if that means anything to you. It's surrounded by 1,500 metre tall mountains and sits on the edge of Iceland's longest ford, Eyjafjörður. The Arctic Circle is just 60 kilometres to the north. It's a fantastic gateway to the natural wonders of the north, but the city itself also has a lot to offer. There's an excellent range of restaurants and cafes. This is one of my favorites. It's in the heart of the city. So there's great coffee, cakes, great range of brunch platters. Fish soup is a big speciality here and vegetarian dishes as well. Um, the old town actually in Akira has buildings dating back to the 1700s. There's an art museum, whale watching tours lead from the jetty. Uh, there's a couple of geothermal outdoor swimming pools and the world's northernmost 18-hole golf course. One of the most northerly botanic gardens, home to some 430 different native plants, can also be found in the town. This is very exciting. This opened last month on the outskirts of Akureyri, Forest Lagoon, a fabulous new geothermal spa with infinity pools, swim-up bars, and a sauna nuzzled into trees with views across the fjord. So when you're based in Akureyri, there's plenty to do, but drive a few minutes, literally just a few minutes outside the city, and you quickly find yourself in scenery like this. Mountains, fjords, a few scattered farms maybe, and the promise of plenty more breathtaking scenery beyond. The diamond circle beckons. Let's just recap where we are. There's Akureyri, and the diamond circle is this area just to the east of the city. That's what we're going to look at now. Zooming in, this map shows the main highlights of the Diamond Circle. Now you can immediately see there are things like waterfalls, canyons, whales, geothermal fields. And we'll look at all of those in more detail in a second. But just take a look at the driving distances between each of them. All those wonderful natural wonders are just on a circuit that's 250 kilometers long. To put that in perspective, that's equivalent to driving from Epsom down the A3 to Portsmouth, crawl along the A27 to Brighton, then stagger back up to Epsom. Now, I know what I'd prefer to do, but let's just demonstrate how compact the Diamond Circle is. Your first stop is likely to be Godafoss, Waterfall of the Gods. It's like a mini Niagara Falls with two cataracts plunging over a horseshoe-shaped cliff up to 12 metres high. Why the name? Well, apparently in the year 1000 AD, the law speaker Poor Beer Le Josvetning Gagadi, I'm glad I got his name out the way, uh, made Christianity the official religion in Iceland, and he promptly threw his old pagan statues of Norse gods into the waterfall, and that's how it became known as the Waterfall of the Gods. This is summer, obviously, but it's just as beautiful in the winter when some sections of the waterfall become frozen into incredible natural ice sculptures. With a little bit of extra planning and guidance from the team at Discover the World, the Diamond Circle can easily be a winter adventure as well as a summer one. More on the seasons and when to go later. Head south from Godafoss along a gravel track for about 40 minutes and you reach the waterfall of Aldeafoss. Well worth a diversion from the Diamond Circle route if you have time. It's one of my favourite waterfalls in Iceland, plunging into this narrow gorge framed by those dramatic basalt columns. And the great thing about this one is you might well have it all to yourself. Sticking to the main Diamond Circle, however, 
drive half an hour from Godafoss, and you reach stunning Lake Miva. It's about two and a half times bigger than Lake Windermere in our Lake District, um, and you should allow at least a day for exploring the volcanic landscape in which it sits. As I mentioned earlier, a road encircles the lake, linking all the main sites. You get a hint of what it's like from this aerial picture. You see moss-covered lava fields on the left there, um, a distant volcanic cone on the, on the horizon, um, and there at the bottom right, some smaller cones. Those are actually the so-called pseudo-craters, formed by gas explosions when lava flowed over areas of wetland here some two and a half thousand years ago. All is calm and green now, and you can hike amongst them. You can probably make out some people on the crater rim of this um, pseudo crater in the foreground here. Bird watching is also excellent. Lake Miva is home to around 60 species of birds, 14 of which are ducks. Most migrate here in late April to breed, um, including the rare Barrow's golden eye and this little beauty, the harlequin duck, which prefers the faster flowing water where the river Laxa flows out of the lake. If you're a keen bird watcher, you'll be very excited to learn that you can also spot short-eared owls and gear falcons in the area around Lake Miva. Bring your binoculars. Just to the north of Lake Miva, uh, things are still hot and steamy. Namaskar on the flanks of Mount uh, Namafietla is a surreal landscape of hissing fumaroles, hot sulfuric springs and bubbling mud pools. It's whiffy all right, but the eggy stench won't stop you at all from wandering around this unearthly place, mesmerized by the rich palette of colors and geothermal mayhem. Like many places in North Iceland, it's a photographer's dream. And why let all this free heat and energy go to waste? Geothermal power is quite naturally a big thing in Iceland. And here in the North, it's put to good use at Miva Nature Baths a glorious outdoor lagoon steaming away at a balmy 36 to 40 degrees, rich in rejuvenating minerals and offering wonderful views across the lake. You can just see it there in the background beneath that volcanic cone. It's the perfect place to relax, I think, after a quick hike up the crater rim of Verfietla. It's only 420 meters high, but it is a proper volcano nonetheless. Uh, it's a steep but straightforward path. You can see the route, that diagonal footpath up the flank on the, on the photograph there. Um, and it's, it's easy enough accomplished even by children. You can walk right around the rim, but don't worry, it's totally dormant. Verfetla um, erupted, I think, about four and a half thousand years ago, covering the surrounding area in ash. There's more evidence of ancient volcanic activity nearby at Dimjaburgir, or the Dark Fortress. This is a very spooky uh, basalt labyrinth where walking trails weave between strange columns, arches, and towers. It's no surprise, as we're in Iceland, that the whole place is riddled with folk stories. You need to keep your eye out for the Yule lads, 13 trolls who spend most of the year hiding in the caves here before venturing out at Christmas to cause mischief. With names like the Door Slammer, Sausage Swiper, meat hook and window peeper, they used to be much scarier characters. But in 1746, the government banned parents from telling their children frightening stories about the trolls. And today they usually just bring presents, the Icelandic equivalent of Santa Claus. Another famous spot at Lake Miva are the uh, Grottagia Hot Spring Cave. Now, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, You'll probably recognize this as the setting where Jon Snow got on more intimate terms with the wildling egret. In fact, several locations around Lake Miva and indeed Iceland were used to film the epic series. In case you're wondering, I'm afraid, no, you can't go like Don Jon Snow and take a dip here. Uh, the water temperature is too volatile and it's a protected site. More hot water can be found here at Viti or Hell, a flooded 300 meter wide crater at Krafla a large volcanic system just to the north of Lake Miva. Last erupted in 1984. And you can follow this wonderful hiking trail through the still warm lava fields, an almost lunar-like experience. This is another so-called explosion crater that's become flooded with warm geothermal water. And it's also called Viti or Hell, but this one is located at Askia, deep in the interior of Iceland. Askia is a volcanic cauldron, 
Um, and if you look at the background of this photo, you can see a much larger deep blue lake. It's actually three and a half kilometers wide and up to 200 meters deep. And that's actually part of the volcanic caldera. To put it in perspective, Here's a Google Earth image showing pretty much all of Iceland, as you can see. If I just highlight Lake Miva, there it is, that sort of green uh, area in the north of Iceland. And you can see the flooded volcanic crater of Askia way, way to the south, deep in the heart of Iceland. Zooming in a bit closer, um, there's Lake Miva on the left and Askia to the right with a dotted line showing the route between them. It's a long day trip starting on a, on a good tarmac road for the first part, then weaving south on a gravel track. So because of the off-roadness of this expedition, you'll need either your own four-wheel drive rental vehicle or join a guided super jeep tour. It's a long day involving at least six hours of driving, but wow, what a drive. You'll pass Herdebrud, um, Queen of the Mountains, which looks like a giant snow-capped muffin, um, you'll ford two or three glacial rivers and negotiate vast weathered old lava flows before reaching the end of the track. A walk across barren volcanic plains brings you to the small explosion crater of Viti, which you can see like a little pimple on the side of the Askia cauldra there. Um, and you can climb down into the explosion crater for a, a swim in the steaming waters after your long drive and hike. I can't recommend this trip enough. I've done it by Super Jeep, shown here, and, indep and independently, and both were unforgettable experiences. This is, after all, where Neil Armstrong came to break in his moon boots and test the Lunar, Rona, L Lunar Rover before the Apollo blastoff in 1969. Here's a shot from my independent trip, traveling in convoy with two other families. Iceland is so different to anywhere else in Europe. But I think when you venture into the interior, the central highlands here, you go a step further. The emptiness of the place, the silence, the raw grandeur, and of course, the sense of adventure. Driving east from Lake Miva, back on the Diamond Circle, if you don't turn off on the gravel track to Askia, but continue a bit further down the road, you come to a turn off that leads to Detifoss. In terms of average flow rate, it's Europe's second most powerful waterfall, churning something like 190 cubic meters of water over the edge every second, compared to the 250 cubic meters generated by the Rhine Falls in Switzerland. But at 44 meters, Detefoss is nearly twice as high as its Swiss rival. And let's face it, the setting and spectacle of this enormous roaring waterfall places it in a league of its own. This is the view from the East Bank, and here it is from the West Bank. Now it gets that color from all the glacial silt and volcanic ash that the Jacolsa River has uh, picked up on its journey across the central highlands from its source at the Vatna Jokul ice cap. Walking trails take you right to the edge of the falls. You can feel the spray on your face and the ground vibrates beneath your feet with Detifoss thundering away like a gigantic cappuccino machine just a few meters away. Here's a wider view, showing the waterfall plunging into Iceland's largest canyon. If it looks familiar, you might remember it from the opening scene of Ridley Scott's sci-fi blockbuster, Prometheus. About 35 kilometers north of Detifoss, we're still on the Diamond Circle, there's another canyon called Asbjergi. It's our next stop on the Diamond Circle. There used to be a waterfall here as well, about 8 million years ago, when a volcanic eruption beneath the Vatnajökull ice cap unleashed a catastrophic flood. Well, either that or the great horseshoe-shaped canyon was created when the Norse god Odin, galloping through the heavens, left a hoof print here. It's now a peaceful retreat, hemmed in by 100 meter high cliffs and sheltering a woodland of birch and willow, quite a rare sight in Iceland. Trails meander through the woods to picnic spots, and you can also hike to a small lake at the head of the canyon, keeping an eye out for the hidden folk or elves that live there. From Asbjergi, the road cuts northwest to meet the Arctic coast, tracing the Tornay Peninsula to reach Husavik. Down at the harbour, a small, a small fleet of lovingly restored oak-hulled herring trawlers and the traditional uh, sailing schooner have found new leases of life as whale watching boats. Husavik is the whale watching capital of Iceland, if not the whole of Europe. 
Working with our long-standing partners, North Sailing, Discover the World can arrange for you to set out into Scalfandy Bay on boat trips in search of some 23 species of cetacean that have been spotted here. One of the most common and charismatic, the humpback whale shown here, is renowned for its tail dives, breaching, and other acrobatics. But you might well also spot minke whales, um, they're smaller than humpbacks, um, but they're frequently sighted. And if you're lucky, you might get a curious individual coming right up to the boat like this. You might also have uh, pods of white-beaked dolphins bow riding or surfing in your wake. Trips operate from the beginning of March until the end of November, but peak season for whale watching is from April to September. Having said that, though, humpback whales are being recorded in the bay year round. And in fact, there's a 97.3% success rate for whale and dolphin sightings. You even get a chance of spotting blue whales if you visit in early summer or spring. Um, other rare visitors include orcas, fin whales, sperm whales, and northern bottlenose whales. Discover the World take a responsible approach to whale watching, even offering a carbon neutral tour aboard Opal, a hybrid electric sailing schooner, which glides through the water in almost total silence causing minimal disturbance to marine life. And of course, it's not just whales, dolphins, and harbor porpoises that you'll see. The bay is also teeming with seabirds, from northern fulmers, like this one, to arctic terns, gannets, guillemots, eider ducks, and of course, everyone's favorite seabird, the puffin. About 100,000 of these endearing little things breed on an island close to Husavik between mid-April and the end of August. And you can join a boat trip that combines puffin spotting and whale watching. Add the hot chocolate and fresh cinnamon buns that the crew serve on your way back to port, and I reckon you have pretty much the perfect outing. Back on dry land, you can find out more about the gentle giants of the seas at Husavik's Whale Museum, which includes 11 whale skeletons, including one of a 25 meter long blue whale. But whales and puffins are not the only claim to fame of Husavik. It's also the home of Fire Saga. So if you're a fan of the Eurovision Song Contest, be sure to head down to the new museum dedicated to Iceland's dynamic duo, immortalized in the Netflix movie, of course, starring Will Ferrell. From Husavik, it's roughly 50 kilometers back to Godafoss, completing the Diamond Circle, and then another 30 kilometers back to Akureyri. Discover the World's Northern Highlights holiday is a great way to incorporate the Diamond Circle in a wider ranging self-drive that also includes the East Fjords of Iceland. But as I mentioned earlier, it's just a starting point and can be tailor-made to suit your timescale, interests and budget. Brand new this year is the North Iceland Family Adventure, a three to seven night holiday based in Akureyri, so you're based in a hotel actually on the outskirts of town in some beautiful woodland. It includes car rental, a whale watching boat trip, and lots of optional extras like horse riding and super jeep safaris. Whatever gives your children a buzz, whether it's outdoor adventure, wildlife encounters, or geography brought to life, I guarantee you will find it in North Iceland. I've taken um, my children to North Iceland when they were eight or nine, um, and they had an absolutely amazing time. Let's return to Akureyri, served by those new nice air flights from Stansted and Manchester. It's not only the gateway to the 250 kilometer diamond circle, which we've just toured, but also the Arctic Coast Way, an amazing 900 kilometer self-drive route. Quick look at the map again, just to get our bearings. There's Akureyri on Iceland's main ring road, but you can also see roads tracing the coastline, hugging those remote peninsulas that jut out from Iceland's north coast. And that's what the Arctic Coast Way is all about. Here it is, all 900 kilometers of it, but you don't have to do the whole thing. It's easily broken down into smaller sections and Discover the World can create an itinerary based on whichever section you want to explore. This 11 night itinerary, for example, is a good starting point for a summer trip. It takes you off the beaten track on the Arctic coastway and also links East and West Iceland in one epic self-drive holiday. The shorter winter highlights itinerary flies you in and out of Akureyri and concentrates on a smaller section of the touring route, while the new adventure in North Iceland itinerary is a two-centre holiday, dividing your time between Lake Miva 
and the coastal village of Siglifjorda, which we're about to visit. And it also includes a super jeep safari, either to Askia, where we, we visited just now, that wonderful explosion crater in the heart of Iceland, if you're visiting in summer, um, or to Detifoss, if you're visiting in winter. Oh, so there are so many highlights. It's going to be impossible to cover them all this evening on the, uh, the Arctic Coastway. And actually, one of the most appealing things about embarking on a journey along the Arctic Coastway is the sense of discovery, you know, the unknown, making it your own journey, following the road, following your finding your own highlights, uh, maybe a lonely lighthouse, a quiet little fishing village, breathtaking beach that you've got all to yourself like this one, or a clifftop view, a, a coastal hike, a, an encounter with seals or eider ducks or puffins. But I would just like to pick out a few places that you should definitely consider including in your itinerary. This is a view of Eyjafjörda. Um, at over 70 kilometers long. It's one of Iceland's longest fjords, if not the longest. Um, and setting out from Akureyri and one or two other small coastal towns, boat trips can take you in search of humpback whales, dolphins, and puffins. So it's not just out of Husavik on the north coast. You can also go whale watching in this fjord too, and puffin watching too. A road skirts the western shore of the fjord, linking several villages and some great hiking spots. And quirky, even by Icelandic standards, the new beer spa, where you can relax in a tub filled with beer. Apparently, the live yeast has a powerful cleansing and health effect. I haven't tried it, but I'm going to take their word for it. While the drinkable beer on tap next to your tub there helps you relax even further, no doubt. Continue further along the west shore of the fjord and you, and you reach the small town of Siglifjörda at the tip of the Troll Peninsula, where you can hike in the surrounding mountains or sit in a harbourside cafe watching the boats come and go. It's a beautiful, colourful place. The town was originally a tiny shark fishing village back in the late 1800s, but actually grew to become Iceland's most important herring fishery. In fact, one of the most important herring fisheries in the whole of the North Atlantic. And now, in the, on the outskirts of the town, the Herring Era Museum has a collection of the old boats and exhibitions all about the fishing and salting process. And locals shown here even revive the spirit of the place with salting demonstrations and traditional dockside dances and songs. Wonderful place to spend a night or two. Hotel Siglo is right on the water's edge in Siglifjörda. Um, has an excellent restaurant serving, as you'd expect, the freshest seafood straight from the boat. Wind your way east or west along the Arctic coastway and you'll come across plenty of dramatic lighthouses. This one's on the Troll Peninsula, just up the road from Siglifjörda. But along with waterfalls and Icelandic horses, I guarantee you'll soon have a good sized collection of Icelandic lighthouse photographs if you explore the Arctic coastway. But they're not the only impressive man-made features along the touring route. Over on the easternmost edge of the Arctic coastway, near the uh, village of uh, Raufahofen, you'll find the Arctic Henge. Not as ancient as it looks, this extraordinary monument began to take shape in the 1990s and is still a work in progress. It's essentially a giant sundial, a bit like Stonehenge, and it's aligned to channel the rays of the midnight sun and point to the pole star. <clears throat> if you delve deeper, you'll discover ancient legends of the four dwarfs of the Voluspa prophecy holding up the sky and other fascinating mythology associated with the Icelandic sagas. East of the Arctic Henge, the goosehead-shaped Langaness Peninsula juts into the Arctic Ocean, a wild forgotten place of ghost farms, abandoned fishing hamlets, beaches strewn with driftwood, and even the ruins of a World War II radar station. Langaness has been left to the seabirds. In fact, it has some of the best seabird cliffs in Iceland, including the spectacular Gannet colony at the Skorovik Cliffs. At the opposite end of the Arctic coastway, the 15 meter tall Vitserka sea stack looms offshore. It's been described as a dragon drinking from the sea or even a rhino, which I can see there actually. But local legend describes a rampaging troll from the nearby West Fjords intent on tearing down the noisy bells at a village church which were keeping him awake, only to get caught out in the daylight on his return home and turned to stone. So that's a brief look at some of the highlights of the Arctic coastway. It really is full of adventure potential, from whale watching at Husavik here, 
to horse riding along bracing headlands with incredible views of the mountains and sea. You can relax in the warm waters of geothermal pools. This is GOC again next to Husevik. And take your pick from a wide range of places to stay, from waterside hotels and farm stays to discover the world's new collection of summer houses. And that's just North Iceland. We can easily arrange for you to fly into Akureyri and back home from Keflavik. Now that, or vice versa, in fact, you could fly into Keflavik and fly back home from Akureyri. And that, of course, opens up a wealth of exciting possibilities traveling between those two gateway towns, either anti-clockwise, taking in the West Fjords maybe, and the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, and Golden Circle, and Reykjavik, or clockwise, through the East Fjords and along the south coast, using Iceland's ring road to link you back to Reykjavik and the, the airport at Keflavik. So let's look very briefly at some of those regions. Wild and dramatic, the West Fjords, West Fjords are another great location for a self-drive off the beaten track. A sparsely populated, little visited, this fjord-riven peninsula has 400 meter high sea cliffs, some of the highest in Europe, teeming with puffins and other seabirds. There are remote beaches, breathtaking mountain hikes, but perhaps the best known site, and my favorite is this one, Dinyandi, a fan-shaped waterfall cascading over seven tiers. This is just one of the tiers. To the south of the West Fjords, the Snæfellsnes Peninsula juts into the Atlantic like a bony finger. and has some of Iceland's most iconic sites, like Harry Potter's Hat Mountain or Kirkjufjella, shown here with a beautiful waterfall in the foreground near the port of Grundafjorda. You can stay at Glacier Lodge, discover the world's three-bedroom self-catering property with views of a snow-capped volcano from your back door. There's some beautiful coastal walks here, plus activities ranging from whale watching to glacier snowmobiling. Just inland, you'll find the stylish contemporary Hotel Husafell, another great base for exploring West Iceland including a must-do into the glacier um, tour, where you walk inside the Langjökull ice cap in a, uh, inside a 500-meter man-made tunnel. Quite an adventure, that one. A couple of hours south, and you reach the famous Golden Circle, a trio of natural wonders, including the Finvetla uh, National Park, Gulfos Waterfall, and Giza, shown here, the original Giza. This is the Stroka Giza erupting in all its glory. From there, it's just a 90-minute drive back to the capital, Reykjavik, well worth visiting for its cathedral, uh, the museums, restaurants, fantastic shops, as well as the new Sky Lagoon, shown here. Another fabulous geothermal pool right on the edge of the ocean, uh, the infinity pool blending with the sea there. Quite a fantastic spot to, to relax in when you're in the capital. But if you travel clockwise from North Iceland, uh, you reach Reykjavik by traveling via the East Fjords and South Coast, as I mentioned just a second ago. So this is Sædisfjord, one of the picture-perfect villages in the East Fjords. That's renowned for its arts and craft culture. But you could equally park the car here and, and set off on remote mountain hikes in the north of the region, or go puffin watching or horse riding. There's plenty on offer in the East Fjords. Continue driving clockwise around the ring road, and you pass the sawtooth peaks of Vestrahorn, looming above a wave-scoured black sand beach, beloved of photographers. The scenery just gets better and better as you follow the road, sandwiched by the ice-smothered volcanoes of Vatnajökull on your right and the ocean to your left. Highlights include Jökull Salen, a coastal lagoon full of icebergs that have been shed by glaciers snaking down from the ice cap. And waterfalls too, including one of Iceland's most famous, Skogafoss, where you can walk through rainbows right up to its base. Whichever way you choose to link the north with the south, whether you go via Husafell and the Snæfellsnes Peninsula or the East Fjords and South Coast, Discover the World can tailor make your trip to suit your timings and where you want to stay. And there's a great choice of accommodation from self catering summer houses to Hotel Ranga, shown here, with its outdoor hot tubs, stargazing observatory, and fine dining restaurant. Of course, you might want to do it all, and that's perfectly possible too. 
The two week uh, fly drive and hike itinerary, for example, takes you full circle right around Iceland on a superb road trip, stopping off at prime hiking locations. And there are also shorter and longer around Iceland options. Well, I hope that's given you plenty of inspiration. Whichever road you choose to take and whenever you choose to travel, the Iceland specialists at Discover the World are ready to help you plan your holiday. Whether it's a Northern Lights break this coming autumn or winter, or a self-drive next summer. I'm now delighted to welcome back our expert panel, Anheide and Eric, who are ready to answer your questions this evening. So Anheide, if I could start with you. I can see you both. Hello there. Welcome back once again. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, as the head of North Iceland Tourism, um, you must be very excited about these new flights between the UK and Akureyri. But how would you say North Iceland is different to South Iceland? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, nice description of North Iceland. We are, of course, delighted here to be able to invite more visitors to the region, both in summer and winter. And if I should describe the difference between the South and the North, I would maybe say it's the winter, it's the climate that is a little bit different. Uh, up here in the north, we have a different climate in a, in a way that uh, we are closer to the Arctic Circle and also because of the glaciers that lie in the center of Iceland that drive away clouds on the way up to us. So we have more snow and less rain, uh, more clear skies uh, and um, so we have a lot of winter activities and, and really enjoy our winter. We also have like a, a more fjords, as you have described uh, quite well already. Uh, and in the fjords, we have high mountains that are very, uh, and the fjords are narrow. So you, you have the mountains in your backyard, if, if you could say so. That is quite different from the views you have in the south. Uh, also, uh, if, if we don't think only about the nature. I think the people are a little bit different as well because we have had less tourism up in the north. So the locals are still very welcoming. They are very keen on developing tourism. And so we, you have many opportunities of meeting entrepreneurs, creating some spectacular attractions for you to see. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Eric, if I could if I could bring you in now. Um, we've had several questions about the best time to go. Um, I touched on you know, midnight sun and summer, the northern lights. Um, what's your favourite time of year to visit Iceland, the north in particular? Personally, I really like September and, and the autumn months. Um, I, I really feel you get the, the best of both, really. You get nice long days, 11, 12 hours of, of daylight. Um, and although it's early in the season, uh, the, mid, uh, the northern lights can be seen. Um, the weather can be better for that. The, the skies can be clearer. Um, so you can have a full day of sightseeing and then hopefully see the northern lights in the evening. Fantastic. Yes, I, I've been lucky enough to see the northern lights in, in early September in Iceland. And yeah, quite amazing. I think those that, that, that month, that autumn month is a particularly good one for, for kicking off the, the aurora season. Um, Arnheide, um, winter, you mentioned just then, is a, is a wonderful time to go. Um, what are, you, what are some of your favourite highlights of, of spending winter up in the north? What, what, what do you get up to, apart from northern lights watching, I, I expect, as a, as a daily habit? Yeah, definitely a daily habit, the northern lights. Uh, but it's also just enjoying the outdoor activities, the snow. So super deep tours, like the one you described to Dettifoss Waterfall or one of the others. Uh, snowmobile tours, uh, husky tours or dog sledding tours, uh, skiing uh, both in designated ski areas or in the heli skiing and mountain skiing areas that we have here are quite popular. Uh, and all ending this with bathing in the evening. We, we love our, our geothermal spas that are all over the place. And that's the perfect way to end the day, just relaxing, uh, gazing at the northern lights, but staying warm at the same time. So, yeah, uh, the, the winter is all about the snow, enjoying in the snow. Fantastic. Thank you. That sounds, I can't imagine a more amazing experience than to lounge one of those outdoor geothermal pools, gazing up at the Northern Lights. That must be incredible. Um, Eric, um, so that's autumn and winter covered. Uh, what about spring and summer? Um, so spring again is a really nice time to go. Um, there is more snow at that time. Uh, it's starting to clear from the, 
the winter months. Um, but again, it can be very good for for the northern lights. You have the the spring and the autumn equinoxes, um, which are some of the best times to to go aurora hunting. Um, and then in the summer months, as as you mentioned, uh, the midnight sun season, it can be a really good way to um, avoid some crowds. North Iceland isn't as as crowded as as the south. Um, but if there are times where um, there's areas that are, are busier, if you're up for an early start or, or to go out in the evening, um, you can have a waterfall to yourself. So it's a really good way to, to avoid that. Mm, fantastic. And not forgetting the puffins, of course. I think they arrive sort of late, late April, early May, don't they? And then they're, they've, they've packed up and gone by the end of August. So they're, they're quite a spring, a spring highlight, aren't they, if you're into birds? Thank you, Eric. That's brilliant. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming in. Um, Alan Hayder, if I could ask you, would you would you suggest attempting the diamond circle in one day? Well, no, I would actually not suggest that. I would always suggest to attempt the diamond circle in five days at least, uh, because uh, even though we have pinpointed out five highlights of the diamond circle, we have so many other things to experience along the route. Of course, you can do it in a day. It is possible. That means you're driving along the route and, and taking pictures, but not stopping and, and, and really enjoying at each location. Uh, so I, I would definitely recommend to stay either base yourself in the Mivat area or Husavik, Akureyri, or to travel along in different locations and, and explore each part of the diamond circle uh, well. Uh, and, and take time in exploring and asking the locals, what should I go and see out here? Uh, getting a little bit away from uh, the, only the highlights, uh, enjoy the nature as itself, because you get really close to nature in North Iceland. And um, that's maybe another difference that we have from the South. We haven't got the infrastructure uh, for every part of the nature yet. So you ha still have this opportunity to be an explorer on your own. Mm, mm. Thank you. That sounds brilliant. Eric, do you have any any top tips for exploring the Diamond Circle to add to that? Um, taking your time, I, I would agree with. Um, uh, it, you can see the waterfalls, uh, Godafoss and, and Detafoss, and, and you touched on some of the, the walking trails, getting different viewpoints, um, seeing them from, from different angles and at different times of the, of the day with, with different lighting. So Taking your time, don't rush it. Um, it's you, you can do that in Iceland. You, you can certainly take your time and and get away from everything um, and and take it all in. Enjoy some of the walks um, and just don't rush it because there, there's always something else to to see that that you may not have noticed the first time. Even going back multiple times, um, there's always something new to 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 see and to stop at. So keep exploring. <laughs> yeah, good good advice. Thank you. I was wondering, actually, to ask both of you, is there any advantage in, in doing the diamond circle clockwise or anti-clockwise? Do you get better views going one way or do you need to do it one once one way and then another time the other way? Eric, perhaps you want to go with that first. Yeah, if you've got the time doing it one way and then the other. Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it. Um, maybe that depends partly on where you're based, whether you're, you're based at Mivat or in Husavik. Um, may, maybe that would dictate it a little bit. Um, but yeah, certainly if you if you've got the time, maybe do some sites in the morning and and then do them again in in the evening. That would be a, a nice way to do it. Mm. Brilliant, thank you, um, Arnheide, um On on that same sort of um, subject, uh, let's let's talk a little about bit about the roads and what are the roads like in North Iceland, particularly the Diamond Circle and the Arctic Coast Way. Um, Diamond Circle is obviously a more popular touring route, and I I'm guessing well. I, I know it's got more paved routes perhaps than the Arctic Coastway, but um, is it straightforward to get around? How would, how would you describe getting around in general on both those touring routes? Yeah, it's uh, they are a little bit different, those two routes, but the roads on, if I start with the Diamond Circle, they're all paved. Uh, they actually finished paving them two years ago, uh, which made us really happy. Uh, they are not cleared of snow throughout the winter, uh, the route to Detifoss waterfall. So be careful when you're traveling in winter time. To you might need to go with a local uh, super jeep uh, tour operator uh, in the winter time. Uh, but other from that, it's quite easy to drive. The roads are really good. On the Arctic Coastway, we have gravel roads uh, for uh, four sections of the route. 
uh, gravel roads are good gravel roads, uh, so you don't need a super jeep, uh, but a but, uh, nice car is uh, definitely recommended. A, a good car, uh, maybe not the Toyota Yaris, uh, but, but a, a little bigger than that. Uh, and again, take your time. Don't look just at the kilometer status. Look at that you are driving a gravel road. You need to drive a little bit slower. Uh, we have a good website uh, called safetravel.is where you can find all the road conditions and if there is snow. But in the winter time, we clear snow of all roads, all general roads in Iceland several times per day, so you should not have any problems. But uh, because you had asked earlier about the diamond circle, which direction you should go, uh, one thing we always look at before starting to travel in Iceland, that's the weather. So I would never answer this question until the day before you were heading off. And then I could tell you which way to start because always look at what the weather will be like. Will you be able to see the midnight sun? Where should you start, et cetera? That's a really good tip, really good tip. Yes, because I, I guess the, the weather can be can be quite changeable. That's one of the wonders of Iceland, isn't it? That you can, yeah, and, exactly. and, the, and from a photographic point of view, the changing light is fantastic and you've got to be prepared for all seasons in one day sometimes, which is what, what makes it so exciting partly, I think. Thank you very much. Um, Eric, of course, you know, self-drive isn't for everybody. Um, is it possible to visit North Iceland and do some of the things we've been talking about without a hire car? It is. Um, there's two ways you, you can do that, or, or three ways. Um, the, there, there are transfers from Accurary Airport to the city. Um, they will meet the, the direct flights um, and, and the internal flights, so that's something that, that we can arrange. Um, and then there's tours out from Accurary Super Jeep tours. Um, you can do whale watching from Accurary. Um, so all of that we can we can help to arrange. Or you can be based in Husavik. Um, again, we can arrange private tours. So you, you can be privately transferred to, to Husavik um, and use that as your base. But everywhere in, in the north of Iceland, um, there's there's guided tours. You, you go out with a, a local guide who, who knows the area, grown up there very knowledgeable um, and quite often gets you to to areas you, you wouldn't know to, to visit yourself. So certainly uh, th there's options there for that as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think you partly uh, answered this question that's just come in, but um, one of our viewers is asking um, if in Accurary, can you do a well watching tour from there or do you need to go to Husavik? I mean, we've, we've looked at Husavik and it has that wonderful sort of ocean you know on the on the edge of Scarfandi Bay a big ocean setting and and I guess it's a different sort of feeling doing the boat trips from Accurary in a more of a fjord setting um what, what are the sort of the main differences perhaps both of you could could tell us about the main differences in whale watching from those two locations Eric do you want to go first yeah so um I believe the um the, the whale watching from Accurary the the fjord is more sheltered um so if if the weather isn't great or if you're you haven't got strong sea legs, um, perhaps go out from, from Accurary um, rather than out into to Husavik, which is more of a, a, an open bay. Um, that that would be probably one of the, the big differences between the two. Um, I think from Husavik, there's more um, there's more choices in terms of, of types of boat. There's the um, carbon neutral trips and the, the, the silent boats that, that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I believe there's some, some rib boat trips if... Uh, if you want to cover more of the area, um, so Husavik's probably got a bit more, a um, bit more variety in terms of how to go whale watching. Thanks, mm. nice. Anheida. You must have done some amazing whale watching trips living up there, have you? What, what, what would you say are the, are the main differences, and what's been your your best experience whale watching? Well, uh, I, I think Eric covered quite well the main difference. It's the fjord uh, in in Eyjafjörður fjord. We have whale watching all year round, which we cannot have in Skjálvandi Bay in Husavik because of the waves. Uh, but the big difference is in the boats and the companies you're selecting. I've done it with the renovated oak boats. I've done the electric schooner, which was absolutely amazing experience. Uh, I've done the rip safaris. Uh, my favorite is always the one I'm on each time, I have to <laughs> say. And uh, doing it now at this time of the year when we have the midnight sun is just spectacular because you have the light all around you and you see the sun it doesn't go under in the ocean you, you just see it go down and then it goes up again there's nothing that can beat that so i think plan for many whale watching trips actually uh, choose your type of boat and, and i'm sure you will enjoy it mm. 
Thank you. Yes, good advice. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching a humpback whale breach under the midnight sun. That's on my bucket list, definitely. Thank you. Um, Eric, um, talking about um, self-drive, maybe not being for everybody, um, we have a question asking if Discover the World runs group trips in Iceland. We do, yes, um, both summer and winter. So the summer tours that we offer are more focused on uh, covering the full circle of Iceland, uh, seeing the different regions, in, including the north. Um, we do have some some guided hiking trips into the interior. Um, so that would, would be an option throughout the, the summer months from, from May to September. Uh, and then in the winter, we have some, some short breaks. So almost uh, an introduction to Iceland would be our, our Northern Light Special trip. Um, which is, is based in the southwest and focuses on on some of the the, the main sites of Iceland, um, and then we have uh, our Orcas and Auroras trip, which is based in the west. Um, that's a good option if if you're a keen whale watcher. Uh, it's based on the the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, um, and it runs in March, which is one of the best times to see orcas off the west coast as well. So, yeah, lots of options depending on on your interests. Um, there's there's usually something for for everyone on the guided tours. Brilliant. Thanks, Eric. That's great. Yes, there, there's a huge choice there. And I guess the, the best thing is just to, to give you guys a call and to tr talk through the options and, and you'll be able to, to, to help out there. Um, and Heide, several of our viewers are um, very interested in the Forest Lagoon that's just opened in Akureyri. Um, have you been? And can you tell us more about what it's like? Yes, uh, I have been. I had the privilege of testing it out before they oh. opened. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, it is just uh, five minutes uh, out of Akureyri Center. So it's easily accessible. But when you are lying and soaking there, you feel like you're out in the nature. It is surrounded by trees, which is amazing. We don't uh, normally have so much trees in Iceland. And uh, this name, Forest Lagoon, actually confused us a little bit first. We couldn't imagine how that could work out in Iceland. But it does. You are surrounded by trees. But you have enough view to look out and into the fjord of Eyjafjörður and see the see the midnight sun. And of course, uh, you're soaking there in warm water that is streaming from the tunnel that were made uh, four years ago. Uh, a, a hot water stream that was actually uh, accidentally hit by the workers there, and we didn't know what to do with this water. So now it's being used for this these. Uh, amazing baths so that's an extra added benefit so i can mm. definitely recommend that one i will be a frequent visitor <laughs> yes very lucky too thank you very much um question just in um eric perhaps you could take this one um from where is it best to join an organized trip into the center of iceland i think um they're asking about the super jeep tour to ask you so uh, for that, there's there's usually two options. Um, there would be the option to be picked up from Accuary, uh, from, from one of the hotels or, or guest houses there. Um, and there is also a pickup from Lake Mivat. So again, if you're staying in, in one of those areas. Even if you're staying in Husavik, um, you, you can go to Lake Mivat and, and meet at the, the Super Jeep base. Um, so anywhere in, in the north of Iceland, um, Again, I, I think you touched on um, one of my favourite things about it is, is the short driving distances and, and the amount to, to see and do. Um, so if you're in Husavik to, to Mivat, that's about 40 minutes. So it's it's possible to, to join one of those tours wherever you're based. Mm. Thank you, Eric. That's brilliant. Um, here's a question, um, Anheide, maybe you could help us with. Um, is there good provision for celiacs to eat gluten-free in North Iceland? Perhaps you could just tell us a little bit in general about what sort of food you can expect there in yes. North Iceland in general. Yeah, well, we often get told by visitors that we are uh, a destination in the winter exactly like Finland, but that we have so much better food. So I guess you can expect good food here. Uh, our food is fresh, uh, a lot of fish, a lot of lamb. Uh, many restaurants are trying to source as much as they can locally. Uh, the restaurants are uh, generally small. Uh, they are often owned by farmers. And uh, so I always recommend uh, that you call in beforehand if you have any intolerances or allergies that you need to accommodate for. But you can easily access uh, uh, vegan food, uh, vegetarian 
and all sorts of uh, different types you need just if, if you contact it beforehand and, and let them know. Okay, thank you, thank you. I've, yeah, I've, I've always thoroughly enjoyed food in Iceland. Lamb is wonderful and the seafood is fantastic. And and yes, good, good vegetarian um, provision as well, I found as well. Thank you. Um, here's a question um, from a viewer, Eric, who'd like to know if you can recommend a short break in Iceland might have touched on this actually. Um, combining whale watching in the Northern Lights, I, I guess we're looking at Snæfellsnes Peninsula, but possibly up in the north as well. Definitely, um, I think the um, the spring equinox uh, and, and particularly the month of March, if you're travelling in, in in the west of of Iceland, uh, we do have the option to do it as a, a guided tour or a self drive. Um, so depending on your dates or your preferences, uh, it's possible to do it. In, in more than one way. Um, in the winter, uh, it's probably the, the West is, is the one to focus on, I think, and the, the, the Orc is off the, the West Coast. But if you were to go in September, um, like I mentioned before, that's still a very good time for, for whale watching up in the North. So again, potentially for a longer trip, um, that, that would be a, a good way to combine the two. Mm, brilliant, thank you. Yes, I've done that trip um, in the Snæfast Nest, looking at the Orcas. Um, that's a great combination. And as you say, September up in the north, good chance of northern lights and whales. You know, two nat quite different natural wonders in one trip. It's a um, pr pretty special experience. Um, thanks, Eric. Anheide, um, someone sent in this question. I'll be back in Iceland for the fourth time, lucky them, in September, and we'll be spending a week in Akureyri. Um, they've already been to the main sites in the past, but would love to find some less well-known ones. So I wonder if you could recommend a couple of hidden gems for us? Yes, uh, I would definitely uh, try to see something uh, of our smaller locations. Uh, I would recommend a tour to Hise Island, which lies in the Eyjafjörður Fjord in September for the famous fish soup, of course, as you mentioned in your presentation, uh, for hiking uh, and uh, just to unwind and relax. It's, a, uh, it's an island that takes uh, 15 minutes by ferry that leaves every two hours uh, and you and you uh, can meet the locals there there are about 180 people that live there uh, you could also go further into the fjord to Olafsfjörður for some uh, sea scooters in Olafsfjörður uh, taking you down under a cliff and the waterfall Miganti, one of the well not so well-known waterfalls that only locals uh, no, because you can almost only see it from the oceans. Uh, fantastic. In Olafsfjörður, there is also a tour that is uh, uh, offered by a cafe that uh, uh, has focus on strong women and hidden trolls in Olafsfjörður area. I will not tell you more. You have to check out yourself. Then along the Troll Peninsula, uh, you can find Soti Lodge and the Brunastadir farm where they make their own goat cheese. Uh, there are hiking uh, tours there, there are kayaking tours. Uh, and of course, you would be in the middle of the sheep farming season. So that's a place to be. Uh, there are also options for uh, horse, uh, horse gatherings in September uh, in Skagafjörður. Uh, Skagafjörður is often called the cradle of Icelandic horsemanship. So I would definitely recommend visiting uh, one of the horse gatherings and or horse roundups and also to leading stuff in Skagafjörður where a German lady who has been living in Iceland for 20 years built a turf house for her horses and has a tool called Horses and Heritage teaching you about the, how Icelanders have cherished the horses throughout the ages. Just to give you a few tips, I don't know how much time I have but I can go on and on with, with those little gems that, that you don't find uh, easily. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Some great suggestions there. Gosh, you're going to need more than one visit, definitely. I think it's, um, I, I've always found when I've been there that it is a place you're hooked on. And as you're traveling around, you're thinking of what you're going to do the next trip because you haven't got time to fit it all in in the one you're doing. So, um, ah, yes, I've got some ideas from that. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, both of you, is, is there a, a, are there any particularly good spots from which to view either the midnight sun or northern lights in North Iceland? What, what would you recommend? visitors. Uh, Anheide, maybe you could go first on that. Yeah, uh, when you're looking at the midnight sun, you always want to go as further north as you can. 
So Green Say Island, that lies on the Arctic Circle, is of course perfect. Uh, you can go there by ferry or by a small plane. But there are also uh, options like when you're coming back from the Diamond Circle or driving to the Diamond Circle, depending on which way you go. Uh, in the uh, Chernes Peninsula, is has a fantastic view. It's near the Husavik town. Uh, uh, th those two, I would say, the Eyjafjörður and, and Skjálvandi are absolutely amazing. Flate Island in Skjálvandi near Husavik as well. Uh, for the Northern Lights, uh, I, uh, you can basically walk out of your, the door of your hotel and look up in the sky and, and you see them. We have, uh, if you're staying in North Iceland for five days, you have a 90% chance of seeing the Northern Lights. But uh, with the tour operator, they take you to locations where the clouds uh, are driven away by mountain uh, storms, etc. So they know a few locations. One is uh, across the fjord where I'm standing in Akureyri, uh, in Vikurskarð or Dalsminni. That, that is a road that is not used as much now because of a new tunnel, so you could easily find it. So there is little traffic on the road, but uh, good visibility often for the northern lights. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Eric, you must have seen the Northern Lights a few times. Where, where are your top tips for where to go? Or the Midlands? Um, I, I always think it's good to, to try and include some, some scenery, um, uh, particularly around the Lake Mivatan area. Um, is, is you can get some really nice pictures if, if the lights show. Um, you can get the craters in the background and, and, and the lake. So there's some really nice photo opportunities. Um, there's a number of Properties that, that will offer a wake-up service for the Northern Lights as well. So if you don't want to be out in the cold um, or if you're a little bit tired, you can warm up with a, a hot chocolate and, and have someone do the work for you. Um, or even better, some of the hotels that, that have hot tubs. Um, you can relax in one of those, look up, and, and if the skies are clear, you, you're already in a, in a perfect location to see them. So mm -hmm. there's not a bad place to see the Northern Lights. Everywhere is good. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eric. A um, couple more questions just come in, a couple of quick ones. Um, Eric, perhaps you could take this one. Any recommendations to enjoy from um, Isafjorda this month? Someone's about to go. That's uh, we're talking Westfjords now, are we? Westfjords, yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, there's some, some very good uh, hiking routes just outside of, of, of the town. Um, you can get some, some really good viewpoints. Um, so there's some suggestions that, that, that we can provide for, for some hiking routes. Um, there is uh, a nature reserve called Hornstrandir, uh, which is only accessible by boat from Isafjorda. Um, not many places like it. There's a, an, an abandoned village, which was due to the, the harsh, work, harsh weather conditions. Um, people couldn't live there, um, were, were, were tired of the, the harsh winters. Um, so that's a very good area for hiking. It's now sort of taken over by puffins, Arctic foxes that, that you can see running around. So very remote and... Uh, very unique in, in in terms of what's offered there. There's some stunning bird cliffs. Um, again, lots of viewpoints in the West Fjords, so pl plenty to to see and do. Wow. And that's Horn Hornstrandia. Hornstrandia, yeah. Hornstrandia, wow. That's another one for my wish list. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. Um, another question just popped up. I can see here. I visited Iceland twice, both north and south, and love the black sweet bread. What is it called, and can I find it outside of Iceland? Who'd like to take that one? Is well, that the lava I, bread? I, I think I can answer that. Yeah, that's the lava bread. We call it rubrið or rye bread. Uh, it's baked in the ground in the Lake Miva region. Uh, you can actually do tours with uh, guides uh, leaving from Café Borgir in Dimme Borgir uh, that take you to the bakery. Uh, of the bread where well basically the ground where it's baked and you have a taste uh, then you can also buy it from stores and restaurants there we love it with uh, smoked trout uh, that's like the perfect way to have it but you can also have it uh, added to your ice cream or simply enjoy it with butter or, or cheese or something uh, you can get similar uh, outside of Iceland, but it's uh, you know it, there are different recipes for each country uh, in that uh, and even each region brilliant thank you very much well i think we're almost running out of time um i've just got one more question i'm gonna put to you um Anheide, um about the pronunciation of your name because i'm almost certain that i've been pronouncing it wrong the whole evening which i apologize for 
<laughs> perhaps you could um, demonstrate how it should be pronounced and, and tell us how long it takes to be able to pronounce Icelandic names. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is pronounced Arnheiður. Oh, that's what I've been saying. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> almost. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult name. Uh, I, I can blame my parents for give, giving me a difficult name like that. Uh, um, it, it usually doesn't take that long uh, for you to learn to pronounce Icelandic names or Icelandic words. And Icelanders are also, they're very willing to hear you speak Icelandic. We are very happy when we hear someone is trying. So even if you say something, uh, that is completely out of the uh, context or, or completely not nothing uh, like it should be. We try to understand it and, and, and we are quite happy. So just keep on saying my name the way you have done it and I'm quite happy. All right, you're, you're too kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, well, thank you both so much. I hope everyone's found that useful. Um, and in fact, I, I hope you found the whole evening useful and inspiring for, for planning your holiday to Iceland, uh, whether you're itching to get away this autumn or winter or thinking ahead for next spring or summer. Um, as I said, if we haven't had time to answer your question, please, please do call Eric or one of the other Iceland specialists at Discover the World who will be happy to help you. Um, and don't forget that with Discover the World's 39 years experience as the world leaders in holidays to Iceland, uh, you can rest assured that you will be looked after every step of the way. And you can book in complete confidence as well with both financial and consumer protection. They can tailor make your holiday to suit your exact requirements. And of course, it's now just a simple matter to arrange a video appointment with them. So I'd like to thank our panel so much once more, and Heide and Eric for shining a light on this incredible location. And a special thank you to, to all of you, our viewers, for joining us this evening. Uh, keep safe, happy travels, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. I'm gonna say goodbye now and leave you with this image of North Iceland's beautiful Arctic coast. Thank you and goodbye.